As always, good to see everyone here this evening. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you here. Uh, I invite you to follow along in our study tonight. We're in the book of Revelation, and we're beginning uh, chapter 12 this evening. So if you want to turn to that text, Revelation chapter 12. Uh, We noted that uh, chapter 11 comes to sort of a uh, crescendo, as it were, with the seventh trumpet sounding and the praise to God erupting as a result of it. And that last uh, trumpet was indicative of God losing uh, all patience with the enemy, bringing them to destruction, and uh, therefore God being praised for his uh, judgment against the enemy and his deliverance of his people. Uh, We're going to begin this evening what most students of the book of Revelation would agree is the second half of the book. There seems to be a natural division at this point. Uh, And no longer do we have any of these series of seven, seven seals, seven trumpets, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, Rather, what we have is uh, kind of a different approach to the same subject. The emphasis of the first half of the book was God's judgments on the enemy. And, you know, there's always kind of the persistent question, I guess, when were these things going to happen? And we have suggested in our study that the book of Revelation is not written to be a calendar, and that you can go to a chapter in the book and say this happened in this year and so forth. Uh, But what we do see in these first 11 chapters is a progressive story of judgment. And if I understand those first 11 chapters correctly, the point is that God is going to take care of this enemy of his people. Now, he's not going to do it all at once. He's not going to snap his fingers and make them disappear. God's people are going to have to endure the wicked enemy while God's trying to get their attention and cause them to repent. And so he sends judgment after judgment after judgment, and yet we've noted that a third of this and a fourth of that are affected, that God will not wipe them out all at once. He is patient and tries to get them to repent, but the point finally does come, as we saw at the end of chapter 9, when it becomes clear that they're not going to repent, And any more message of partial judgment is therefore suspended. Remember in chapter 10 that John heard a voice and he was told, don't write that down, seal that up, that's not going to happen. God has run out of patience as it were, the next step is for him to destroy this empire. And that's what we saw in chapter 11, that after this time of persecution, this three and a half years or 42 months, that God finally does judge this wicked empire, having given it every opportunity to repent and having been patient with it. Now, can you put your finger on a date in ancient history and say this is the time when the first 11 chapters were fulfilled? I don't think so. I don't think it works like that. And the question of the book is not when, but what. What is God going to do about the enemy of his people? He's going to destroy them. He's going to judge them. That's the message. He's going to redeem his people. He's going to protect his people. We saw them sealed. We saw them on earth and then in heaven. And so uh, we saw the temple measured as well, another symbol for that same picture. So God's going to protect his people. What the enemies on earth do is not going to destroy God's people, uh, but they're going to have to be patient as they endure with God judging this nation. Uh, The second half of the book is a little bit different. The emphasis in the second half of the book is the evil nature of the enemy. And we're going to see here in kind of staccato fashion, portrait after portrait after portrait of the enemy. And it begins here in chapter 12 with this dragon, And then it goes to chapter 13, to a beast, and then to another beast, and then to the harlot. And so over and over again, we're going to be shown that this is a nation that, as far as God is concerned, is ripe for judgment. And there is no question about its wickedness. And there is no reason to wonder, will God really uh, do this? Yes, it is a wicked nation as far as God is concerned. Now, one thing that is the same in both parts of the book, however, is this idea that God is going to defeat this enemy, and he is going to give his people the victory. 
And so that theme runs from 1 to 22. But there's a little bit different emphasis in the presentation as we come to this second part of the book. And there is a sense, I think, in which the second part of the book ends in an even bigger bang than the first part of the book. Uh, The first part ended there in chapter 11, where we were back at the throne scene, all creation praising God for destroying this great enemy. But the second part of the book is going to end in heaven with God's people with him there. And it is going to be after we see the pictures of wickedness of this great evil empire that in chapter 20 God is going to unleash his judgment. And as we've talked about in other contexts, the judgment is only enhanced by the wickedness of these other chapters. And so once we get a sense of how wicked they are, then we see the big bang of judgment at the end and glory as the final scene. Uh, Also, however, chapter 12 is, it's not a hard and fast, you know, draw a line right down through the book here and, and it's completely different because what we're going to see is that chapter 12 begins with another presentation of the struggle that these Christians were going to have to go through. And there is a sense in which it retells the story of chapter 11, but it's going to use different images. Uh, There's almost a sense, at least in my way of thinking, in which the second part of the book is more graphic than the first part. And so if you thought the first part was bad, uh, you'll really like the second part. Blood up to the horses, bridles for miles and all that stuff. So um, that's what we're going to uh, begin looking at here this evening in chapter 12. Now... If you've read chapter 12, uh, it's a fascinating scene. There is a woman that appears, first of all, this heavenly kind of woman. She is clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet. She has a a crown of 12 stars. And she is about to give birth to a child. And then John sees a dragon, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns. And he stands before the woman to devour the child that she is about to give birth to. And before he can do that, a war breaks out in heaven. And the dragon is thrown out of heaven, down to the earth. And he persecutes this woman who has by now given birth to the child. Uh, The woman flies off into the wilderness The dragon opens its mouth to flood the wilderness and to destroy her, but we are told that the earth drinks up the river that the dragon spews out, and so he is unable to destroy the woman or the child, and that's where this story ends. It's a fascinating picture. There's really nothing else like it in all of the Bible. Now, we have been taking the approach to the book of Revelation that this book meant something to the people that first heard it, that this was not written to tell them about what was going to happen thousands of years later, but that it was written about their situation and what they were going through. And I want to suggest to you tonight that if you had lived in the Roman Empire in the first century and read chapter 12, that there would have been very little of this text that would have seemed strange to you. And I'm not just talking about if you were a Jew, a Jewish Christian, or a Christian. I mean, if you were a pagan, and you picked up the book of Revelation and read chapter 12, there is nothing here that would have seemed really strange. Let me suggest to you something that might be going on here. There was a very well-known myth in the ancient world, and we look at these things and say, well, how well-known could it have been? You know, we look at these things, and I didn't, I've never heard the story of Apollo, and it doesn't make sense to me, but the myth of Apollo was about as well known to people in Asia Minor as the story of George Washington cutting down the cherry tree is to us. It's something that everybody had heard about, and there was no reason to suspect that this was some kind of weird story. This was part of the religion 
uh, of the pagans in the first century. The story goes like this, that the goddess Leto was pregnant with Apollo by Zeus, the king of the gods. We're told by one of the ancient uh, authors, Hesiod, that Leto was joined in love with Zeus, who holds the Aegis, and bare Apollo and Artemis, delighting in arrows, children lovely above all the sons of heaven. So she gives birth to Apollo. Well, the problem is that this Zeus character here is married to another woman. He's the king of the gods, and he's married to a woman named, or a goddess named Hera. Hera is jealous that Zeus has been unfaithful and had a child with another goddess. And so out of jealousy, the story goes, Hera sends Pytho the serpent to attack Leto, this uh, lover of Zeus. And the myth also said that her child was destined to kill the serpent. Well, as the myth goes on, Zeus sends winds and carries Leto to an island, the island of Delos. And Poseidon, the god of the sea, then hides the island under the water so that Hera cannot destroy her. All of a sudden, you begin to hear some echoes, some parallels here. Well... The story goes on, and here is uh, uh, Apollo there in the uh, sculpture, and you see on the vase here Artemis, Apollo, and Leto uh, being depicted together there. As the story goes on, Apollo comes to Delphi in ancient Greece. If you're not familiar where Delphi is, this is Athens. You go just a little bit west and north, and you come to Delphi. There, Apollo finds the serpent, and he kills it. And Delphi, therefore, becomes the home of Apollo's oracle and shrine. And all over the ancient world, everybody knew that if you wanted to talk to the god Apollo, you had to go to Delphi in Greece. And uh, you see on the coins here, uh, here is uh, Apollo and the serpent here. Here is, uh, again, Apollo killing the serpent, and he has his bow and lyre and all those things with him. Very, very common in ancient art to see this story depicted. As a matter of fact, if you've ever looked at ancient artwork on temples and vases, you probably have seen this and might not have even known what you were looking at. Now, Apollo was the god of prophecy. Uh, among the pagan gods, it was very, very rare that a god would ever speak to a person. There was no revelation like in the Bible where God tells people what he wants and what he thinks. In pagan religion, the gods pretty much keep to themselves. But one exception to that is Apollo. Apollo is a god that talks to people in the ancient world. And he is often depicted with a liar. And the reason for that is the idea was that music would put you kind of in the mood to receive the communications of the god, and so it was kind of associated with him for that reason. Apollo is also associated with the sun. He is called Phoebus Apollo very often in the ancient texts. He is also associated with the bow. You can see in the drawing up here that he is holding a bow, here on the coin down here, he is holding a lyre. That's very typical of how he is depicted. And he has shrines all over the ancient world, not only at Delphi, but at Bronchidae, Claros, which is in Asia Minor, not far from where these letters are addressed. So you think about Apollo. And we've already seen a rider with a bow back in chapter 6. We suggested that that was a play on Apollo. We've got Apollo, and we've got the sun, we've got a serpent, we've got a fight, and all of a sudden you begin to understand that people in the first century could have read Revelation 12, and it wasn't all that strange of a story to them. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's neat. But what in the world does that have to do with Christians? Well, the fact is that Roman emperors often depicted themselves as the god Apollo. Roman emperors were all about power. 
And however they depicted themselves, whether on coins or in statues or temples or whatever, they did so in such a way to enhance the image of their power. And one of the ways they did that was to depict themselves as gods. And the god that is most often associated with the Roman emperor is the god Apollo. We've already mentioned in a previous context that in the first century, in the 60s and uh, early 70s or, or late 60s, that Nero builds a house in Rome, and in front of this house, he has this 30-foot statue of himself in the likeness of Apollo. And everybody knew what that meant. You go down to Nero's house, there's the statue, the emperor and the god look exactly alike, claiming to have the power of Apollo. But Augustus, even before then, connected his own rule with the golden age of Apollo. And he kind of rewrites some of the myths, and if that seems strange to you, they did it all the time in the ancient world. Myths could change very easily. He is now cast not as the son of Leto, but as the son of the goddess Roma, who is the patron goddess of Rome. Augustus in the mythology has become the son of Roma, just like Apollo was the son of Leto. He is the new Apollo, as it were. And there are some other symbols associated with Apollo. One of them is the laurel. And if you look at Roman artwork, fountains, coins, statues, you will very 99 times out of 100 see the Roman emperor with a laurel wreath on his head. Why? That's there to remind you that he's associated with Apollo. It's not just a victory crown. It's not a decoration. It's a way of saying this man is a god like Apollo. And so you'll see this laurel stuff all over the place. I think I've shown you this picture before, but uh, this is from a villa slightly south of Pompeii in which Nero is depicted as the god Apollo. You can see the laurel. Uh, that particular turning of the head is the way Apollo is usually depicted in artwork. And when you paint somebody with their head turned that way, everybody in the ancient world knew what it meant, that he's looking like Apollo when he does that. Uh, Alexander the Great is always depicted that way for the very same reason. Uh, but not only on the paintings, on the coins. This is a coin of Nero. You can see, again, the laurel wreath on his head, and in case you didn't catch that, you flip the coin over, and there is Mr. Apollo with his lyre, so that it is very clear to you that the person on the front of the coin is associated with the person on the back of the coin. The Roman emperor has the power and the might and the, the, uh, the deity of Apollo. Uh, here's an altar from Augustus, and again, what do you see? A big laurel wreath. It's not just there for decoration. It's there to tell you this emperor is associated with Apollo. And you can see on the coin there. Here we have Augustus on the front and Apollo with his bow on the back. So again, just in case you didn't catch it, the coin makes it very clear to you. And you certainly get the impression after looking at some of this that coins are not just money in the ancient world. They're propaganda pieces. That's what we have here. Uh, here is a coin. You can see the letters ACT, ACT. This is Augustus again. Remember he had defeated Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium? Well, ACT stands for Actium, and what this coin is telling you is that Augustus was able to be victorious because he has the god Apollo pictured there with the lyre on his side that he is able to reign and rule by the power of Apollo. Some of you may see, have seen this statue. This is in the Vatican Museum in Rome, very famous statue of Augustus called the Prima Porta because of where it was found. And you look at it at first, and it looks like just he's got a fancy suit of armor on, but everything on this piece of armor is saying something about Augustus, and right there is Apollo with the lyre. You can see the lyre there very clearly. And there it is in close-up right there, Apollo with his lyre. 
And so in the ancient world, every image that you looked at of the emperor screamed Apollo. And if you knew Apollo at all, you knew the story about what a powerful god he was, how he had conquered the serpent, and all of those things. But that's not the only thing. If you were to go to the city of Pergamum in the first century, to which one of these letters is addressed, there was standing in the middle of town the great altar of Zeus, which some have suggested was Satan's throne that John mentions here. But even more importantly, on that altar is this sculpture that wraps all the way around it. And this sculpture is there to describe how the Pergamum kingdom was founded. It was founded as the result of a war, and that war is depicted as a battle between the gods and the giants. Here are the gods, here, helmeted, shield, and so forth, and look how the giants are depicted. This guy here with the serpent tail. This guy here's got one as well. The enemies were depicted as a serpent. And the story of Pergamum was that we won our kingdom by defeating this great monster of an enemy that we had. Not only that, if you were to go down to Egypt, you would find the myth that the world had been terrorized by the goddess Set. Isis dreams that she will have a child to avenge the death of her husband. She gives birth to the god Horus, who is hidden in a swamp. This idea of a god coming along and protection and battle, you can see that it is just part of the ancient world. But even if we go back further than that, back to Old Testament times, these are some images from various uh, cultures. I think the, this one here is Babylonian. And look at here, this guy here is fighting this great big dragon that has seven heads. And here is the king of Babylon killing a great serpent. And here is the king of Assyria having put the serpent at his feet, the dragon. And so you get to understand that when John uses this imagery, he's tapping into something that the pagans would have understood. But what John is doing is he's using that imagery to tell his story. He's going to use that imagery to, to tell the story about how God is victorious over his enemies. However, there's another piece to this. This kind of imagery appears in the Bible itself. In Job 26, 12 through 13, Job says, He quieted the sea with his power, and by his understanding he shattered Rahab. Rahab is not the harlot from the book of uh, Joshua. That's the name of this serpent. By his breath the heavens are cleared. By his hand, his hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. And that's just imagery that Job is using. That God has destroyed great and powerful foes that are depicted as if they were serpents. Psalm 89, you crushed Rahab like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. If you know anything about parallelism, you know that the enemies and Rahab there are parallel to each other. That God's enemies are like a great fierce monster that attacks God's people and God kills the monster. Isaiah 51, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? And so even the Old Testament writers use this imagery of a serpent as the enemy of God's people and how God destroys it and conquers it. In Jeremiah 51, 34, we hear the people of Israel saying, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has devoured me and crushed me. He has set me down like an empty vessel. He has swallowed me like a monster. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He has washed me away. 
That's what the Babylonians were to the Israelites, like a monster that they couldn't destroy, but God could. Psalm 87, I shall mention Rahab and Babylon among those who know me, God says. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. Notice that Rahab, that great figure of a monster, is now associated with Babylon, the enemy of God's people. And so when we look at Revelation chapter 12, great red dragon, seven heads, horns, crowns, woman that looks like the sun, diadems, it's a really weird picture to us, but it really wasn't weird to them. And I, it seems to me that an ancient reader would have been able to pick this up and say, makes pretty good sense to me. Story about a dragon or a serpent getting killed. That was a common, common way of talking in the ancient world in religious uh, talk. Combat tale involving a dragon was common in the ancient world. Many readers would have recognized John's imagery. But here's the point we're trying to make this evening, that John is now going to use this imagery in a way that mocks the emperor cult and pagan mythology. He's going to use their imagery against them. You want a story about a woman and a snake? John says, I've got one for you. You want a story about a serpent getting killed? I've got one for you. And this, is, this one happens to be the truth. So let's look at the, uh, the story. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. She is of heavenly appearance. Uh, we get this kind of imagery in Genesis 37 about Israel, and so the first clue suggests to us that she is a representation of the people of God. And it may be that she is a mockery of Artemis, who is sometimes associated with the moon in Greek uh, religion. Even if that isn't uh, what's in the forefront here, uh, notice that she wears the victory crown. And that's always a clue in the book of Revelation as to what we're looking at. This woman in heavenly garb wearing a crown of victory, that's a pretty good clue that we are here looking at a figure or a symbol of the people of God. And remember what we saw in chapter 11, two witnesses. Well, we suggested that those two witnesses represent the people of God as they testify to the truth and are persecuted by a wicked world. This is the same thing, just in different language. This is, again, the people of God, described as this beautiful woman this heavenly woman wearing a victory crown uh, in heavenly in origin. In Isaiah 51, verses 2 through 3 and 11 through 9, we have this imagery rooted there. Look to Abraham your father, Isaiah says, and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. There's that imagery of a woman giving birth. When he was but one, I called him, and I blessed him and multiplied him. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and her wilderness he will make like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and a sound of melody. We have a wilderness here in Revelation 12 that the woman is taken to. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. We just saw that. Skip down to verse 10. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed? That's the Exodus story. And by the way, you look at the Nile. You ever seen an aerial photograph of the Nile? What does it look like? Looks like a snake from the air. And what does God do? Cuts it in two so his people can cross. See how this imagery comes back here. So, verse 11, the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion and everlasting joy will be on their heads. God's going to destroy the monster and bring them home again. They will obtain gladness and joy, sorrow and sighing will flee away. Isaiah 66, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can 
a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her sons. And then God goes on to talk about how he's going to comfort them. Look at verse 14. He will be indignant toward his enemies, for the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So if you read this story here in Revelation 12 and you see this woman, you say, I know what's about to happen. There's going to be a fight. There's going to be a war. And the serpent is going to be destroyed. And God's people are going to be victorious. And again, if you're still not convinced, this is a coin that circulated during the time of Domitian, who was probably the emperor when the book of Revelation was written. And what do you see here? You see a child sitting here with stars around it. What do we have here? We have a woman clothed with the sun and on her head a crown of 12 stars. This imagery was everywhere in the ancient world, and people understood it uh, very readily. Verse 3, Then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns on his head were seven diadems. He's powerful. Notice the number seven. Seven is normally associated with what in the Bible? Good things? Days of creation? Keep going. Perfection? Take another step. God. <clears throat> Right? The guy who did all the creating, the guy who did all the creating, and so forth. Uh, often associated with God. This dragon thinks he's God. He at least wants to appear as God. That's his appearance, seven. And he wears seven crowns, not the same crown that the woman wears. There are two different crowns, remember, in Greek, and this is the other crown. He wears the crown that a king wears. And immediately we begin to understand maybe what we're looking at here, that we are now looking at the Roman Empire that worships its emperors as gods, that has put men in the place of God, kings in the place of deity. And we'll notice here it says that uh, he has ten horns. Now, in apocalyptic literature, a horn represents power. And the fact that he has ten of them means that he has, he's pretty strong. Ten is a number of perfection and completion. And so he has a lot of power. He is able to persecute the saints, as it were. And uh, verse 4, his tail sweeps away a third of the stars, threw them to the earth. Remember, stars falling as a way of nations tumbling. And maybe the imagery is not here just that he's strong, but he has... He has already destroyed other nations. This is a picture of the Roman Empire. But there's one people that he has his eye on, and that's in verse 4. He stood before the woman so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And so in verses 5 and 6, we hear about the birth. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. You can't listen to that verse and not hear Psalm 2, where God says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. I have given you the nations as your inheritance, and you will shatter them uh, like pottery with an iron rod. This is the Messiah. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Satan cannot defeat God's son. He didn't. Even though he killed Jesus, Jesus was taken up to God in great victory and exalted above every name, as we already know. The woman then fled into the wilderness she, where she had a place prepared by God so that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And again, you hear the word wilderness in the Bible, and you can't help but think of the Israelites in the wilderness, that after they were slaves in Egypt, that God brought them into the wilderness to provide for them. He gave them manna. He gave them quail on a couple occasions. He protected them from their enemies. But it was also a place of testing, where they had to walk by faith, because it was a hard life to live in the wilderness, and they had to trust God every step of the way. That's what these people are going through. God's saying, I'm going to put you in the wilderness. I'm going to take care of you. 
I'm going to make sure that your enemies don't hurt you, but you're going to have to be faithful. And 1260 days is three and a half years or 42 months, the very same symbol that we saw in chapter 11, the time of persecution for God's people. So if you know what the symbols mean, it becomes very clear that John is saying, now there's going to be persecution. This Roman Empire in which you live is going to turn against you. And there's going to be a period of time in which you're going to be persecuted and you're going to have to be faithful and trust in God. He's going to take care of you. Don't you worry about that. But this is what's going to happen. But there's more to the story than that. Verse 7 there was war in heaven. And I think that the picture here is John saying, now, before we go on, let me pull back the curtain and show you the rest of what's going on here. There was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. This is what's going on, not on the earth, but up in heaven. Paul says in Ephesians 6 and verse 12 uh, that our, our, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, uh, that uh, we do not war according to the flesh, but our uh, weapons are powerful for the de destroying of strongholds and fortresses, places of wickedness in the heavenly places, and so forth. John says... I want you to understand that this persecution you're going through and that you're going to go through is not confined to this world. It's not just good and evil down here. This struggle, this conflict between good and evil stretches from one end of the universe to the other. And in heaven, there is a battle going on between good and evil. It's not just here on this earth. And what we see, therefore, here is the cause. Why is the Roman Empire persecuting God's people? Well, John says, if you knew what was going on in heaven, you would know that there is a great wickedness spiritually, not just on earth, but spiritually. And it's trying to, to wrestle the kingdom away from God. It wants to rule the universe. And we're going to find out just in a moment who this dragon, this serpent is. It's Satan. He wants to rule it all. And he is at war with God and he's at war with God's people. And that's why you suffer, John says, because you are caught up in a great conflict. One of my favorite illustrations, I didn't put the picture with it here, but if you go to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, uh, there is a house there right across the street from the cemetery that faces the battlefield, and there was a woman there, her name was Jenny something, anybody remember her name? Uh, Jenny Wade, that's it. Killed by a bullet while she was baking bread the day the battle started. And you think, well, what does that have to do with anything? I'm about to tell you. The point is, if you live on a battlefield, you're going to get hurt. And John is saying that's, that's where you live. You're on a battlefield. There is a war going on all around you. So don't be surprised when the persecution comes. You're in the middle of it. And that's the way it is. One author has put it this way. The words hint at nothing less than a supreme attempt on the part of the dragon to unseat the woman's son and reestablish himself in the presence of God, as God, we might even say. Now, there's a question raised about Michael here in verse 7. Some have suggested that this is Jesus. I don't believe it none. Jesus is never depicted as an angel in the Bible. Michael is rather the same character that we see in the book of Daniel, who rises up to defend God's people whenever they are in trouble. He is an agent of God that fights for them, but he's not the Messiah. But the point is that heavenly beings, the archangel of God, is involved in this struggle fighting for you up in heaven. And the result is 
Verse 8, they, that is the dragon and his angels, were not strong enough. They couldn't win this battle. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And you read that and you say, now it makes sense. Why is the world such a rotten place? Revelation 12 and verse 9. Because this is where Satan does his thing. He's lost the battle in heaven. And so what he wants to do now is control the earth. If he can't reign in heaven, at least he says, I'll have God's creation. I'll get it. And so he has been thrown down to the earth, and now he and his army of wickedness are down here. And what, guess what we're going to see in chapter 13? Who has he recruited to be on his side? The Roman Empire. So this explains why there is persecution of the saints on the earth. He is called the accuser in verse 10. The kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before our God day and night. That's the Old Testament uh, term for Satan, that old adversary. It's always trying to stir up rebellion among God's people. That's what he's doing now. And they overcame him. I think that's anticipatory here. We're going to see the Big Bang later on. But here's, here's how it all ends, John says. I'm not going to keep you in suspense. The fact is that he loses this fight too. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. So John says, no need to worry. The people of God, yeah, they're going to, they're, they live on this battlefield. There's going to be hardship and persecution. That's going to be real. Be, there, let there be no doubt about that. But they're going to win in the end because they have the Lamb on their side who has cleansed them from all sin and purified them and because they've been faithful to the word of the gospel. And if you're faithful to the gospel, there's not a thing your enemy can do to you. And so, for this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Remember, there are those who dwell on the earth. Those are sinners. Those who dwell in the heavens are God's people. Woe to the earth and sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. Remember what Jesus said? These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. There's not a finer illustration of that than Revelation chapter 12. Well, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he can't defeat God in heaven and God's turf. He's thrown down to the earth and he says, okay, then I'll destroy the people of God. I'll destroy God's creation. And he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Remember that this woman represents the people of God collectively. Jesus came out of the people of God. He was born of one of them. And he's gone up to heaven, but they stay on the earth. And so this woman represents the people of God here. And what happens? Well, Verse 14, the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place. That's an image that we find often in the Old Testament. In Exodus 19, God says to the Israelites, I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God, it's as if I took you out of Egypt and flew you over to the wilderness to protect you. Deuteronomy 32, Moses reminds the next generation, like an eagle that stirs up its nest that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them, he carried them on his pinions. And Isaiah, giving hope to his generation, says that those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength, they will mount up with wings like eagles. And the idea is that they will be able to escape their enemy. Their enemy will not be able to overcome them. And so she flies into the wilderness where she is nourished for one, two, three and a half, three and a half time times and half a time during the time of persecution. So the persecution is going on. That's not going to stop. But God says, I'm going to take care of you. Like I gave Israel manna in the wilderness, I'm going to take care of you. And if you'll be faithful, nothing can happen to you.
The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away by the flood. Remember in apocalyptic literature that something coming out of the mouth is usually lies. Mouths are the source of lies, uh, in these, especially when you've got these really weird creatures opening their mouths. And what is he going to try to do? How can he destroy God's people? Well, the easiest way is by getting them to believe a lie. That's how Satan works. How did he get Eve to rebel against God in the garden? Get her to believe a lie. Tell her what is false. Entice her with what is false. And so that's what Satan's going to try to do to these people. Remember what Paul says in his letters? In the last days, evil men will come with their deceptions waxing worse. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, haters of parents, insolent, all of those things. It's coming, it's coming. John says by the time he writes 1 John, you've heard that it's coming and it's here. It's here in John's day. The flood of false teaching, Paul said to the elders at Ephesus that after I've gone, savage wolves will enter among the flock teaching perverse doctrines. Paul knew that a, a wave of false doctrine was headed for the church to try to destroy it. That's what John's talking about here. The serpent opened his mouth and tries to wash it away, flood it out with false teaching. But the earth helped the woman, verse 16. The irony is it's not the church that absorbs all this false teaching, it's the world that absorbs all this false teaching. And the world becomes full of it, but not the church. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, went off to wake, make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony. Who are the rest of these children? Uh, Christians in other places, Christians later on, not sure. All right, we're, uh, we're out of time for this evening. Do um, you have any questions or observations before we quit? I know I've kind of left short time for that, but... All right, then we will pick up with 13 next time. Thank you.